Big round of applause now for Jeff Zimmerman. In the fall of uh, 2003, it was the Australian summer, and I worked as an assistant to a kangaroo shooter in the outback. And what that means is I wasn't allowed to operate a firearm, but I was essentially reduced to being a golden retriever with opposable thumbs. We'd hunt at night, and I'd stand on the back of a truck as we drove through the bush and spotlight kangaroos. He'd shoot them, and I'd go grab them, drag them up to the truck, and then we'd gut them, and I'd throw them up on the truck and repeat until nearly dawn when we would go back to this tin shed that was our base camp and go to sleep all day. And we were on a one million acre ranch about six hours drive away from cell phone coverage <laughs> and camping near the garbage dump uh, for the ranch. And um, you know, reading a lot of Hunter S. Thompson and just generally having a lot of awesome tattoo work did not prepare me for the job as adequately as I had assumed it would. Because <laughs> I'd just do dumb stuff. I'd slip with the knives and bang them on a rock and make sparks and dull the knives or slip in a pile of kangaroo guts or something. And, and every time that Craig, the roo shoot I worked with, he'd say, bloody useless, bloody useless, he'd say under his breath. I thought it was my name, bloody useless. Um, you know, you hear it two or three hundred times, it starts to get to you a little bit. So one night, we're driving back to camp with a truck full of kangaroo meat, and we busted a flat tire. And I saw this as an opportunity to kind of prove myself a little, or earn, earn back a little cred. So I grabbed the jack, and I was like, oh, man, I got this. I, and I jumped off the truck, and got under it, and I started to jack it up. But right as it's at the top, it slips off of the jack. It just goes <clears throat> like that while I'm still under it with all that meat and truck and everything in it down. And it scared me bad. And all this cold stuff started falling on the back of my neck. And I thought, oh, God, there's a coolant leak. Now what? And I looked. And it was OK. It wasn't coolant. It was actually just cold blood dripping out of a kangaroo severed neck stump. So I did what anyone in my position would have done, is I leapt to my feet and issued a series of high-pitched girlish squeals. <laughs> And Craig was just standing there looking at me, and he's covered in blood and dirt, and so am I, because so is everything. And he's one of those fat guys who's also muscular and made out of bullet-riddled leather, and his <laughs> ears have calluses on them, you know? And he just looks at me, and he's like, thought you knew how to change the time, eh? And I said, well, I do, like, in America, in a driveway, in the daytime. <laughs> just give me a couple minutes here. I can take care of this, but... And he looks at me, and he just said, Mac, what you know about taking care of yourself? I could ride on my cock with a mop. <laughs> and then he just gets under the truck and fixes it with one hand and probably rolls a pack of cigarettes with the other, you know? And that was just, that was just him. He had something for everything. He could just handle every little situation and he could eviscerate you and be over it in 10 minutes and I would just fume for hours. So one day I sweated myself awake at about noon because it's like 110 outside and my pants, the only pair of pants I brought, were so soaked with animal blood, they were sort of like this wearable scab I would pull on and off. They actually drew flies, which was awesome, because otherwise the flies would try to drink from my lips and eyes as I slept. So I kept them in the corner of my room, and the flies would kind of bunch over there, and things were good. And one afternoon I woke up, and my pants were gone which is troubling, because like I said, it's my only pair. And I looked around, and then I looked under my bed, and there was a six-foot-long lizard chewing on my pants. <laughs> they're called racehorse goanna. They're a kind of monitor lizard, and they're scavengers that crawl around the outback and eat any old dead thing they can find. And my pants were apparently so soaked with blood it thought they were meat. They're dangerously stupid, and if you scare them, they try to climb up the nearest tall thing, which in an outback situation is usually you, and they'll just <laughs> lazarate you, and all they don't wash after they eat. So all this rotten meat gets into the cuts, and you can go septic, and we'd have had to drive six hours to call 911. So I'm whipping books at the thing to run it off, and uh, my pants represented a score for this thing, I guess, because it starts dragging them out of my room, and then I thought, oh, fuck, because... The only way to look worse to this guy would be to report to work that night with no pants and tell him I had allowed a giant lizard to steal them. So I'm whipping books like Discs of Tron and I finally hit it in the ribs and it spits my pants out and runs off. 
And I thought, well, awesome. And I was looking forward to being like, yeah, until they ran off a lizard later, you know? Yeah, it was no big deal. And um, I start to go back to sleep, and the door to my room kicks in, and Craig is standing there, like, silhouetted, wearing only a pair of filthy, blood-stained Ugg boots and a nasty little pair of black underpants they call budgie smugglers in Australia. And he's like, you! Yeah! And I said, dude, did the lizard get your pants, too? Because I totally kept mine. And, then, and he was like, you knew? You fucking knew about this, and you did nothing? And I said, knew about... And he's like, go on! He drags me into the kitchen. We go in our camp kitchen, and our cooler is upside down, and all our eggs are smashed on the floor, and there's all milk in it, and lizard footprints through it, and it just licked up all the eggs, and then danced around and made a little French toast batter on the floor, <laughs> and then ran off. And he said, right, listen! Next time you see one of these things, you run it off the property properly, right? It's not just about you and your little pants. It's about all of us. You've got to chase them off. And I said, listen, man, um, the next time a giant lizard comes around and tries to eat my pants, I'll observe the protocol that you've just laid out. <laughs> but you cannot sit here and tell me that this is like a normal thing I'm supposed to know about. <laughs> Do I sound like I know about these kind of things? And I was like, I'm not like you, man. I don't kill kangaroos or like swim with sharks and punch them or whatever. And he, ah, oh, sharks and nothing, man. If you don't want to fuck with a shark, just don't get in the bloody ocean. You're not like bears. And I was like, what? And he said, you're not like bears, man. And I said, bears, let's pull it back. He said, well, I've seen a fair few nature television programs. And it's my understanding that, you know, sharks will eat you, but bears, man, they can swim, they can run, they can climb. If a bear wants to eat you, you're fucked, eh? And I said, that's a way of looking at it, but my parents have seen bears, and I've camped, and they've come around my campsite, and if you know what to do with your food, they're not gonna, they're not gonna bother you. And he's just like holding this mop while we're mopping up, and he leans forward and says, bears have come around your campsite, mate. And I said, yeah. What'd you do? And I was like, we just laid low and eventually got bored and left. He just looks at me and says, oh, I'd have been so bloody scared. <laughs> Thank you.